There are three biological concepts that I think are really important for us to think about today. One is biological variation. The second concept is uh, data gained from individuals versus population studies. And then finally, the problem of defining sexual orientation. Biological variation can be seen in almost any characteristic that you wish to, to point out. Characteristics like your eye color, characteristics like your height, weight, your blood pressure, all kinds of characteristics follow a distribution. So not all of us have exactly the same temperature. If we took everybody's temperature right now, it would not be 98.6. That's the average. There would be some above, some below. And so if we would plot all of those data, we would find what's called a normal distribution. And you can see a normal distribution for almost any biological characteristic you wish to measure. So we're not all alike. We vary. What I'm going to suggest to you today is that sexual orientation is one of those biological characteristics in which there is variance in the population. That it falls under the same kind of normal distribution that every other biological characteristic falls under. If we look at the uh, best studies, they would tell us that there is prevalence of gay males in the population of about 4 or 5 percent. I'm talking about exclusively gay males. If you look at the prevalence of lesbians, it's about 2 to 4 percent in the general population. This does not seem to rely on ethnicity. It does not need, uh, rely on nationality. When we look at population-based evidence, there, there are some things we need to keep in mind. Population-based evidence relies on the group. You're talking about the average. You're talking about the mean. You're not talking about individuals. And so many of the studies that we're going to be looking at today are population-based studies with thousands hundreds to thousands of people in each of the studies. When you look at population-based studies, or what we call epidemiological studies, one individual case doesn't prove or disprove the evidence. One individual case is what we call anecdotal evidence. And that's why, in order to understand the broader aspects, you must look at many, many individuals. Let me give you an example. Smoking causes lung cancer. You cannot open your newspaper. You cannot turn on the TV or read a magazine without getting this message. We are convinced of it. The data are overwhelming that smoking causes lung cancer. However, you may tell me, well, not all smokers have lung cancer. I have an uncle who's smoked 50 years He's 95 years old, and he's just fine. And I will say that's correct, because the epidemiologic evidence is different from the individual evidence. On the other side of that coin, not all lung cancers are the result of smoking. So you have a variation in the way that people respond to this particular environmental assault. I want you to think about are, are problems that we encounter in all of the studies that I'm going to be talking about today. This is very difficult, especially in studies for sexual orientation, and that has to do with the study design and the definitions. And so the problem is how do you accurately define and categorize an individual's sexual orientation? If you're going to study a group of heterosexuals versus a group of homosexuals, how are you sure that you have an accurate uh, separation of those groups? If you ask someone about their identity, if you have a hundred or a thousand people that you have in your study and you ask them to identify themselves, you will get a very different number and percentage 
if they answer you on that basis rather than if you ask them a question about their sexual behavior. If you ask them about their sexual behavior, you will get a different number than if you ask them about their attraction. So we know from the literature that if you ask people about their attraction, that almost half of the population will tell you that at one time or another, they have been sexually aroused by the same sex. That's different than behavior, which is having a sexual encounter with the same sex. And that's different from identifying yourself as either homosexual or heterosexual. So you can get widely different percentages depending on the way you ask the question and, of course, the group to whom you ask the question. We all know that there is no laboratory marker. There is no test. We can't take your blood, run it through a machine in the lab, and say this person is gay, this person is lesbian, this person is bisexual, or this person is transgender. That kind of test does not exist and probably never will. So what we have to do is to rely on self-reports and be careful to ask enough questions to try to get an accurate reading on the population that we're trying to study. So if you start with a mixed population and you ask, are you homosexual or heterosexual, what you'd like to be able to do is absolutely accurately divide those two categories so that any trait that you wish to study, you've got, you have a good difference between the two. What is the usual case? The usual case is that you will not have 100% accuracy. And so your study is not going to be perfect. And I don't know any study that is a perfect study. Why does this occur? Well, when you ask that question, someone may not really know or they may not have accepted their sexual identity, their sexual orientation. Perhaps they know, but they're afraid to reveal that. The other thing that can happen is that definitions are not clear. That's why I wanted you to think about this difference between identity and behavior and attraction because those are very important distinctions to make. So if you just ask someone the simple question, are you homosexual or heterosexual, they may be scratching their head trying to figure out what you're really trying to find out, what you really want to know, and how they are to answer that correctly. So all of these things make, make these studies difficult. 